big headline alert. RFK Jr. is teasing a report that says Tylenol use in pregnancy and folic deficiency in pregnancy leads to autism. Sounds like the neat smoking gun everyone's been waiting for, right? Except it's not neat, it's not a gun, and it's definitely not backed by strong science. I'm Dr. Mona, pediatrician and mom, and today I wanna to break this down in plain language. Should pregnant women toss out their Tylenol? Should they panic about folate? Let's separate the science from the scary sound bites. And by the way, if you like science without the scare, hit that subscribe button now. Let's get into it. Here's the first thing to know. Autism does not have a single cause, but politicians and wellness influencers love single cause stories. They're catchy, they fit in a headline, and they make parents stop mid scroll. The problem is turning a complex neurodevelopmental condition into Tylenol or folate deficiency equals autism is like blaming one Lego piece for the whole castle collapsing. Way too simple, way too misleading. As a pediatrician, I sit with parents who are genuinely scared about these headlines. They'll ask me, did I do something wrong when I was pregnant? Was it the medicine I took? Was it the food I ate? And I always remind them, autism is not something that can be pinned on one Tylenol tablet or one vitamin mist. This is a neurodevelopmental condition that develops from a combination of genetics and environment, not from a single everyday choice. Genetics being a strong guiding force. Have an autistic kid? Likely it's you or your partner passing down genetic information, not that Tylenol you pop during pregnancy. First to begin, they are going after Tylenol, which is a brand name of acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient. The real attack should be on acetaminophen, but Tylenol is what they're saying in the news, so I will be referring to that. Let's look at the Tylenol research. Most of the studies that make the news are observational, and what does that mean? Imagine you're sitting in a coffee shop, casually watching people come and go. You notice that people who order black coffee often seem to be in a hurry, while those choosing lattes tend to stay and chat. You write down what you see and look for patterns, but you don't ask anyone why they pick their drink or change anything about the shop, you just observe. You might spot a link, but you have no way to prove what's causing what. That's what observational studies are like. Researchers look back at who reported taking Tylenol in pregnancy and compare outcomes, but they can't control for all the other variables, something we call confounding variables. Maybe the moms who took Tylenol had high fevers, more infections, and more stress. All of those can affect development too. That's confounding. So when you see a headline that says Tylenol linked to autism, what it really means is in one data set, kids exposed to Tylenol maybe looked a little bit different, but that is not the same thing as Tylenol causing autism. This is where sibling controlled studies come in and they're really powerful. Same family, same genetic material, same environment. If one pregnancy involved Tylenol and the other didn't and there's still no difference in autism rates, that's much stronger evidence. And that's what happened in the largest study we have done in Sweden. Researchers looked at nearly two and a half million births and when they compared siblings the supposed link disappeared. No increase in autism, ADHD, or intellectual disability with Tylenol use. Some of the smaller studies that raise concerns are still out there, and you're gonna hear them quoted. I talk about those in detail in my other video on Tylenol use in kids if you want a deeper dive. Now, those sibling studies are powerful because they cut through a lot of noise. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but wait, didn't a brand new review just come out saying that there is an association between Tylenol use in pregnancy and autism or ADHD? Yes, in 2025, researchers reviewed 46 studies and found the overall evidence was consistent with an association. And that's important. The signal did persist across studies. But here's the key. The certainty of that evidence was graded as only low to moderate. And why? Because every single study was observational which means we can't rule out confounding things like fever, infection, or genetics. Add in the recall bias, parents trying to remember what they took years later, and the picture gets even blurrier. This is where we need to pause and separate correlation from causation. Correlation just means two things are linked in the data. For example, kids who carry backpacks are more likely to have pencils. That doesn't mean backpacks cause pencils. They just tend to show up together. Causation, on the other hand, means one thing, directly leads to another. Like smoking 
can cause lung cancer. In these acetaminophen studies, we keep seeing a correlation. Kids with ADHD or autism were more likely to have moms who reported taking acetaminophen in pregnancy. But because of the design of the studies, we can't prove causation. Other hidden factors could explain the link as well. That's why major medical groups like ACOG and the American Academy of Pediatrics haven't changed their guidance. Acetaminophen is still considered the safest option for pain and fever relief in pregnancy when you need it. You are not taking it around the clock. It's an as-needed basis. And one of the biggest reasons pregnant people even reach for Tylenol is fever, which brings me to another important piece of the puzzle. What happens if a fever goes untreated during pregnancy? Untreated fever can be risky. High fevers in pregnancy have been linked to miscarriage, preterm labor, and certain birth defects like congenital heart problems and neural tube defects. And remember, the infection causing the fever can be dangerous on its own. So if you skip Tylenol out of fear, you may actually be choosing a riskier path. And no, ibuprofen, or Motrin or Advil, isn't the safer backup, especially later in pregnancy when it can affect the baby's heart and kidneys. That leaves acetaminophen as the safest, most studied option we have. So the shaming linking Tylenol to autism is problematic because one, it isn't supported, and two, it's highly risky and can lead to pregnant moms without an option when in pain or having a fever, and leading to ibuprofen, which is not recommended in pregnancy, or suffering, which is not fair to a pregnant mother who's already struggling with the pregnancy. Now, let's shift to folate because remember, RFK Jr.'s claim wasn't just about Tylenol, and this just seems out of left field. He also brought folate into the mix, and folate deficiency in pregnancy is a real concern, but not for autism. We know folate deficiency increases the risk of neural tube defects like spina bifida. That's why folic acid supplements are universally recommended before and especially during pregnancy. You might hear that kids with autism sometimes have low folate levels, and yes, some studies have found lower folate, often due to cerebral folate deficiency, a different condition, which isn't just about what mom ate during pregnancy. It can result from the child's own diet, feeding challenges, or even their immune system making antibodies that block folate receptors. But it gets complicated. Other research has shown that higher folate levels can be linked with autism diagnoses. And some large studies suggest that folate might even be protective. When you look at the research together, reviews, and meta-analyses, the takeaway is pretty clear. Folate deficiency in pregnancy doesn't consistently change autism risk. And routine folic acid supplementation doesn't prevent autism either. There are rare cases where a child with autism and cerebral folate deficiency might benefit from a special form of folate treatment, but this is a very rare and specific medical situation, not the explanation for most autism cases across the board. The real risk, when the science is messy and inconclusive, it opens the door for wellness influencers and gurus to sell special folate supplements as a cure. These products are often unregulated and sometimes harmful if not discussed with a clinician. Bottom line, folic acid is important, not because it prevents autism, but because it prevents neural tube defects like spina bifida, which is backed by decades of strong evidence. So we've covered Tylenol, we've covered folate, now let's zoom out. Where does autism risk really come from? And I've spoken about this in many videos. Autism is highly inheritable. Large genetic studies estimate that around 70 to 80% of the risk comes from inherited factors. That doesn't mean the environment plays zero role, but it does mean most of the story is in our DNA. And here's something we need to name out loud. It's very typical to put the blame or onus of autism risk on a woman, what she did or didn't do in pregnancy. Tylenol, vitamins, diet, stress. But half of the genetic material comes from the father. And in fact, research has suggested that paternal traits and age may carry even stronger genetic links to autism risk. It's easier for society to say, mom caused it, than to acknowledge the complex interplay of both maternal and paternal genetics. Environmental exposures like severe infections during pregnancy or extreme prematurity can add small risks. But even then, the added risk is usually much smaller than the internet makes it sound. Autism is woven from many threads, mostly genetic, sometimes environmental, but not from one single everyday medication like Tylenol or missing a folate supplement. And this is why these single cause claims don't hold up. Autism isn't one thing with one cause. 
Trying to pin it on Tylenol or folate deficiency oversimplifies the science and misleads families. And so now we see people like RFK Jr. pulling at straws, grabbing whatever they can to prove a cause or make a point. And let's be honest, the timing here isn't about science. Earlier this year, RFK promised that he would reveal the cause of autism by September. And that is not how science works. Science doesn't run on press conferences or political deadlines. If it did, pediatricians and scientists would have found more reasons and risk factors for autism. What we need is more funding into genetic research and looking at males as well. What this is all doing is fueling fear. It makes parents second guess safe decisions in pregnancy. It creates guilt for moms already doing their best and already struggling during pregnancy. And it shifts the conversation away from the real needs of autistic individuals and their families. Here's the bottom line. Folate deficiency does not cause autism in pregnancy. Take folic acid to prevent neural tube defects, not because it prevents autism. Tylenol in pregnancy does not cause autism. The strongest studies show no link. An untreated fever and illness and misery when sick can actually be more harmful. If you need Tylenol, it's safe to use as directed. Most women are using it as needed, and that is okay. Parents deserve facts and not fear. If this video helped calm some of the anxiety stirred up by headlines, share it with a friend who's pregnant and probably saw the same scary post. And remember, medical advice should be coming from medical professionals, not from politicians or influencers with a discount code and an affiliate link. Make sure you're subscribed because we all deserve the science without the scare. Stay well.